So quick thing before we get started, uh, how many of you are iOS devs? Cool, I apologize to all of you because I'm an Android dev. How many of you are Android devs? I apologize to you because I don't use Kotlin yet. <laughs> so cool, got that out of the way. And the rest of you, I don't know why you're here or maybe you just don't want to raise your hands. But cool, today I'll be talking about how to develop mobile apps securely. Um, obviously before we get started, I thought they were injecting JavaScript into my slides at first, but it turns out that's legalese. Um, I'm sure it's important for something. Um, quick disclaimer of my own, I am an Okta speaker. I do not speak for Okta. So anything I say is my own words. Um, any examples I may use, I'm not trying to pick on anybody, any one country or group or anything like that. It's just I'm making up examples in the spot. So, Cool. So let's start things off. Is perfect security possible? No. <laughs> it's not. Even if you put your server in a cement block at the bottom of the ocean, somebody's got a submersible with a drill. All right? If you want it to be usable, it's not poss possible to have perfect security. That's not what we're aiming for here. All right? So what are we aiming for? We're aiming to prevent scalable attacks. Like, basically, hackers are lazy. We want to make sure that if they hack one of our users, they don't get everybody. You know? We want to make them work hard. Like, if yours is harder to hack than somebody else's, they're going to go for the easier target. So you want to make them really work for it. And then finally, end users will use the easiest path forward. So you really need to think about everything you do in terms of their point of view. Try to make, them, make the easiest path the most secure path, the best path. Because otherwise they'll work around you and that voids all of your effort. All right, kind of the top OWASP models, like OWASP puts out this list every year of like attack vectors versus very different groups. And kind of like the top five are all things I'm going to try to at least touch on here today. So like, it's things like improperly using the OS, you know, insecure data storage, like that's a big one. Um, insecure communication or insecure authentication, basically using protocols wrong or just not using them at all. And then insufficient cryptography, which basically means trying to encrypt something and just doing it wrong. So what are we trying to protect here? You know, what, what are the things that are important? So first off, we have session tokens or access, so access tokens. You know, obviously, these are the things that let you hit your server endpoints. Your server is where the data is. That's where the important stuff is. All right, and kind of along that same vein, anything that can get you an access token or a session token is just as valuable as the actual session or access token itself. That's like something a lot of people forget and something you really need to keep in mind. Thirdly, especially these days, more and more government regulations are out there like GDPR or all these other things popping up in various US states. Like PII is just as valuable these days because also kind, kind of tying into that second point, PII can be used to get a session token. You know, everybody has that forgot password flow or that forgot username flow and those tend to fall back on PII to kind of determine who you are. All right, and finally, you're all making your own applications. You know, you all have your own secrets. I don't know what they are. You don't know what they are. If you're a bank, it could be your social security number. You know, if you're a chat app, it could be your chat logs, your chat history. Like, every app has their own secrets. Um, also, a few of the things I listed here are some things I'm going to touch on in a minute. These are things that are key to your mobile code or should be that also are secret, or at least pseudo-secret. Things like cert pinning, uh, tamper detection, obviously, usernames and passwords. I'm going to say this every time I put usernames and passwords on here. Don't store these on disk, <laughs> ever, okay? Um, and then obviously API tokens, because again, accessing things that are secret. So I think there were other talks about this. I'm just putting up here real quick. I'm not gonna go into OIDC, but some of you may not be familiar with the flow of the things come out of it. These are the things I've kind of been referencing. So I wanted to show a quick little common use case flow. Um, so here, and the client will talk to the server and be like, okay, hey, I want a code, an ID token, and I want offline access. The offline access especially is common in the mobile perspective because you don't want to have to prompt your username and password every single time you go through. And then the server endpoint will return back the ID token, the refresh token, and the authorized code. So that authorization code, you then go to a token endpoint, which could be the same server, could be different. It really depends on what resource is being guarded. Um, and use that authorization code to get another ID token and access token. So this is a very common OIDC flow, and these are kind of the important things you get out of it. So like a common use case would be you're a chat app. You know, you want the user to sign in, you're doing say Google's OIDC login, so you kick out to a Google server for the authorized endpoint. You say, hey, I want a code so I can get an access token, this ID token so I know what their profile is, who I'm talking about here, 
in the offline access because I don't want them to have to sign in every single time they open the app. All right, and then you get the float code back, go to the actual chat server endpoint, and be like, hey, I want to get the chat logs, here's my authorization code, give me the token for this. So I kind of mentioned these real quick, but I'm going to go into it real quick. Like, what are the important things I'm getting out of this flow? You know, these are the secrets we're trying to protect. These are the important things. So first off, that authorization code I mentioned, this lets you get other tokens. This lets you get access tokens. This lets you get ID tokens. So that's something you need to protect. You know, anything that lets you get something else, got to protect it. All right, the access token, obviously, this is the same as the session. This lets you actually get the chat logs, get whatever information you need, whether it's profile information, chat logs, chat history, yada, yada, yada. All right, that ID token, this is something specific to OIDC, so you may not be as familiar with it if you use OAuth typically. Um, but this ID token typically has a lot of information about the user, various claims. It's very customizable depending on whatever server flow you've created. Um, so this ID token is something that contains a lot of PII data typically. So it's not really something you should be passing around a lot. Just get it once, use it for yourself, and it's not like don't send it on every request because you don't really want to add to the risk. Um, and then the refresh token. This is the big boy. This is the important one. So the refresh token is what the purpose of it is to be kept on disk, is to be kept around so that you can get access tokens later. So this is the one I'm going to try to kind of focus on for a little bit here because this is important. You want to keep it around, but it can get you access tokens. So that's that second point I talked about earlier of anything that can get you something else is just as important as what you're getting. So, but before I really get talking about how to protect it, first, like, what are the things I shouldn't be doing? You know, what should I avoid? First off, and this is something I see surprisingly often, never hard code secrets in your code. Your code is deployed to an OS. That OS has to execute the code. That means by definition, anything in your code can be reverse compiled, because otherwise Android or iOS would not be able to execute it. So if you're ever putting secrets in your code, that's a big no-no, because even if you obfuscate, and if you do all this like, you know, advanced stuff to it to make it hard to reverse compile, it's always possible to reverse compile, so somebody can always find those secrets. And as soon as the secret's lost, it's not a secret, and it has no value. So another one, don't store anything on disk that's a secret in clear text. You know, obviously this is the big thing about the refresh token and other stuff. Um, this is the obvious one, you know, don't store things in clear text. Second, of, be really careful about allowing secrets to be backed up to the cloud. So the problem with here is not like that I don't trust Google or Apple, it's that I don't trust Google or Apple. <laughs> so like, we don't know what they do. It's a black box. You know, we don't know if they cache these on the phone in an unencrypted manner. We don't know how they store them on the server. Like, you know, there's that big thing a couple years back where NSA tapped into all of Google server-to-server -server communications, rules unencrypted. Like, we don't know if they're doing that. So it's really best to just avoid backing up secrets at all. You know, back up non-sensitive data, sure, that we had that nice continuous user experience, but let's try to keep the secrets a little more sensitive. Let's try to avoid having those backed up. Um, don't try to create your own encryption algorithm. I'm not a PhD in math. I know PhDs in math who also don't want to create their own encryption algorithms. Like, these things are tried and trust, uh, tested. Millions of people try to hack them every day. Like, trying to roll your own is just a great way to invite disaster. Like, the math here gets really complex. It's just something you should try to avoid as a day-to-day -day developer. Go with the defaults. They're good enough. You know, it's fine. And then finally, try to avoid sending data over unsecure connections. You know, and I'm not, not talking about just non-SSL internet connections here. I'm also talking about, like, Bluetooth, NFC, you know, Zigbee. All those like local communication wireless patterns, those are unsecured typically, so you really shouldn't be passing things over them. Like right now, I guarantee you, if I had my phone in Bluetooth mode and I was broadcasting signals, there's at least probably eight people out there sniffing just for fun. So try not to send anything over unsecured communications. Okay, but Hans, you say like storing things on distant clear text is bad, but like, you know, all modern OSs, like they're sandboxed, you know? iOS, strong sandboxing around apps. Android, just as strong, especially more modern versions of the OS. But like, it's completely worthless as soon as the phone is rooted or jailbroken, all right? Because anything that has super user access, like Android specifically, like it's Linux user permissions. As soon as an app has like super user permissions in Linux, they can change whatever access they want. 
they can see anything in clear text inside your user profile, inside your user permission space, inside the OS itself. So like it's, it's just all the sandboxing goes out the window as soon as it's jailbroken and rooted. So as long as you plan on running a jailbroken and rooted phones, like it's really something you should avoid. And a lot more phones than you think are jailbroken or rooted. All right, so have you ever heard of Heartbleed? And some of you may not. Like it was kind of a niche thing, but a big deal. So like a, like a couple years back, SSL itself broke. This thing called Heartbleed, you know? And it was basically down to like this really subtle, like race condition-y kind of thing in the code. And like that kind of brings up my point of like, OSs are extremely complicated. There's always undiscovered bugs. There's always undiscovered issues. Like, no matter how hard you try, no matter how sound you make it, there's going to be something that some clever attacker is going to find. So you shouldn't trust the OS to maintain its sandboxing. Like, there's probably at least a dozen undisclosed vulnerabilities out there right now that we just don't know about. Or we know exist, but don't know how they do it. Like, we know that the NSA has a couple. You know, we know that Israeli research firm that helped out the FBI for that San Bernardino incident. We know they got one that still to this day we don't know what it is. So you can't really trust the app sandboxing. So, Hans, you're being really paranoid here. Yeah. That's our job. <laughs> We're supposed to be paranoid. You know, if you're developing in a secure manner, paranoia is like your baseline. That's your standard line. So, Okay, now I've gone and tried to scare you all a little bit. What can we do? You know, what, what can I do to try to protect myself? And there's kind of a, a few basic patterns that you can go through. So first there's obfuscation. Basically what obfuscation is, if you're not familiar with it, is you basically shuffle around your code, add a couple of fake paths, add a couple of fake variables, just to make it harder and more confusing to figure out what's going on. Um, and there's a second category that some people think is not obfuscation, but I definitely consider obfuscation. And that's, quote unquote, encrypting something when all the secrets you're encrypting with, they're right there next to the encrypted file. Like if you have a JKS with a strong 64 like, character password, and right next to it is a text file that says JKS password with the password in it, that's not encryption. <laughs> that's doing nothing. Even if it's not like a text file next to it, if you're using like, something like the serial number of the device, something that's easily discoverable, where all it takes is the attacker to figure out the pattern, that's not encrypting it, because they can reverse it as soon as they figure out your pattern. That's obfuscation. All right? Step up. You know, this is what you see in a lot of apps where they have a pen code. Octomobile does this. And that's encrypting using user passcode, some piece of information that's in your user's mind, but not on the device. And what you do basically is use that user passcode either to create a key every single time or when you're storing that key on the device. All right? Then we have the new hotness, storing in the keychain or the key store. This is the secure enclave. This is that trusted execution environment. This is where there's a separate chip on the device that the keys are generated in and executed in, and they never leave that device. Like, the chips are actually designed to not be exportable. All right. And then we have the easiest, the best, arguably the least useful version, only keep it in RAM. You know, never, just never even bother putting it down to disk. This is a good option in a lot of cases. So let's kind of dig in on these some. First, we have obfuscation. Like I was saying earlier, if the effectiveness of something requires the attacker not knowing how it works, then it's not security. It's just smoke and mirrors. All right, this should really only be used for things that are baked into your app code, things like key pinning, tamper detection, root detection. Like, your code has to be executed, so the best you can do is obfuscate. So it is helpful sometimes just to make it, again, like I said earlier, make it harder, make them work for it. That's where obfuscation comes in. Things where you can't practically encrypt it, but at least make some put a little effort into it, you know? And I'm gonna dig in a little bit on these three points, because these are things that not everybody's familiar with and I think are important as well. So first off, a quick aside on the key pinning. If you're not familiar with key pinning, what its intent is is to help prevent man in the middle attacks. All right? If you're not familiar with man in the middle attacks, that's where somebody's sitting in your Starbucks uh, Wi Fi, they've hide that jacked the DNS so that your first communication goes to them instead of Google or wherever you're trying to get to. And then they basically rewrap your entire communication so they can read everything in between. And it kind of relies on CA certs and spoofing the CA cert system. So like a lot of like, like state level attackers use this route because like they'll go directly to the ISP and be like, hey, you have that trusted CA cert, you're gonna re-sign all your communications with that because everybody comes through your router anyways. So key pinning kind of helps prevent both the state level attacks and the guy in a coffee shop attacks. And there's kind of like two different aspects of this I kind of want to dig in on, um, because like a lot of people aren't familiar with it. So actually, let me talk about how it works first. 
So if you're familiar with SSL, or even if you're not, like you have this like cert chain. It's a, basically you have your company's cert, you know, Okta.com, signed with Okta's key. And then we'll go up one layer, and we'll go to that CA and be like, okay, you signed us saying, hey, this is us, sign it saying you trust us. And so on and so forth, all the way up to like those core high-level CAs that like governments trust, things like RSA or Komodo or what have you. So it's basically, it's a chain of trust saying, everybody trusts this guy just because the internet wouldn't function without it. And then he said, okay, I vouch for that guy, who vouches for that guy, who vouches for that guy. So the problem with the attack we're trying to prevent is one of those middle-level guys not actually being trustable. So what you do is you check your leaf cert that's from you, from your servers, and you say, okay, I'm gonna check the public key of that. I know my public key, I've talked to my ops guy, I know what keys we're actually using to sign our certs. If that key doesn't match what I'm expecting, then we have a problem. That's the core of key pinning. So the trick there is that, how do you get that public key? You know, wh where's that public key come from? That public key, you have to have a list on the device somehow so that your phone knows what public keys to check, like what is coming from our ops guys. And you should use a list because say an ops guy leaves or you know, your CA starts expiring, you should use a new key every time. These things rotate over time for a variety of reasons. So you kind of want like a backup list so your apps just don't all break every time an ops guy leaves. So you have a list of them, all right? But how do you get that list? Where does it come from? There's two approaches. One, bake it into your app code. That's where the obfuscation comes in. You know, you have this hard-coded into your app, and that way every single connection checks that list of keys that's in your code, and if it doesn't fit, throw it out. All right? The downside to this is it requires your users updating your apps. And I don't know about you guys, but getting users to update apps, surprisingly difficult. <laughs> so eventually they'll kind of fall out or be vulnerable as you rotate keys, because those bad keys will still be trusted by them. But the upside is every single connection will have it. It's there as soon as they install the app. The other approach is a trade-off. It's a much more updated way to do it, is the first time you talk to your servers, you say, hey server, along with your response, give me the list of public keys that you should be trusting. All right, and it sends back a list. And you just like put that list, encrypt it onto disk, you know, do whatever goodness with it. And that way, you can keep that updated much, even on old code, much more frequently. But the downside is you have that one untrusted connection. So really choosing between the two is up to you. It's up to your use case. What's your tolerance? What do you feel like going with? It's, it's a trade-off. Um, and the two styles I mentioned here is there's kind of two ways to do it. It's either open pinning, where you only pin against your sites, and if it's not your site, you're kind of like, well, let's just let it go and trust it and see what happens. This is good for like, if you use like a lot of metrics in your app or like third-party services where it's calling like Firebase or it's calling Apple servers and you don't know Apple's public key, you know, you don't know Firebase's public key. Um, but the other option is closed options where you know your app's only gonna be talking to your own servers. So if you're ever talking to like a different server, that in itself is something you should be alarmed about. So there you just use closed pinning. Be like, if I don't recognize the domain at all, like just, just throw the whole thing out. Just get it all out the door. All right, and I'll try to be quicker about this one, but tamper dissection is basically trying to tell if your app's been rewrapped. A common attack pattern uh, is to go through every app in the App Store, every app in the Play Store, download them, just put a quick little script that like injects something into it so they can track them and then upload it as a new app. So tamper dissection helps prevent that. Basically you're just trying to check to make sure your app's not modified and you just check the hash of the code in your app against like what it actually is on the device. And like, you know, you hard code in what the hash should be and just compare the two. And if it's not, you know, flag an alert or break the app or whatever you want to do. Um, it's pretty easily bypassed, but it's great for those script kitties who just run a script against everything in the store. And then root detection, as Apple says, root detection is impossible. That's Apple's official stance. Because it basically is. There's so many ways you can do it. And like by definition, if you're getting something rooted, it's something the OS maker didn't intend anyways. So it's kind of those chicken or the egg problems. Like you can't permanently detect it. You can try, but it's the best, it's a best effort thing. Um, and basically some people do it to try to take defensive measures or stuff like that, but it's difficult, but still an option for some people. So okay, let's get past the obfuscation. Let's get on to like the real stuff, the stuff you care about. Encrypting things on the device. Any of those secrets like the refresh token. So user passcodes, great option. Um, Slightly more complex to implement. You know, it takes effort. You have to add a whole UX flow for this. You have to get a pin from them. You have to have pin creation flow. You have to have recovery flows. Um, it's really only useful for things that exist while your app's in memory. So if you have background operations that happen a lot, you don't have a pin while that's happening or while that's going on. You know, it could have been six hours. You know, you don't have that in RAM still. So anything encrypted by it, you can't really get access to. So it's only good for your flows that are only available while the user's present and actively in your app. 
but it's very useful for those flows. Um, a side note, when you're doing it, definitely have a brute force prevention mechanism in there. Don't let people just guess a million pins, because, you know, common use cases, not that complex of a number space. You know, you're probably doing like six digit pins or something like that, just for, because there is a usability trade off. And then, but it is reasonably secure, you know, depending on how long the passcode is, it's, it's not bad. So how do I do this? All right, here, high level method, hopefully you can read the code, and it's a little bit small for you guys in the back. Um, I'm sorry guys, not Kotlin. <laughs> But first step, generate a random AES key, all right? You need something to encrypt things with. And then after that, and that's the, I'll dig into this method in a minute, but you store the key. This is where that passcode comes in. You're storing the key with the passcode. The passcode is not really there for the rest of the encryption algorithm. Um, but I do wanna go into like the rest of the encryption algorithm just for those of you who aren't familiar with it. So you initialize the cipher, and I won't really go into this method because like there's a million examples online. It's like fairly standardized, but you initialize a cipher and you get two things out of it. Well, two things to create it, actually. You get the cipher itself. This is what will do the encrypting. This is your encryption cipher. You know, there's a couple different options. You can kind of look online for good samples. But this IV um, stands for initialization vector. This is there to prevent that second point I had back in that goal slide, scalable attacks. All right, this initialization vector means that every single thing you encrypt starts with a different seed. It's like when you encrypt something, it's just like a, a cycle over a bunch of bytes. And it kind of uses the little bit of the last one, a little bit of the next one. So this initialization vector means that if they happen to crack by accident one of your encrypted files, they can't just use the exact same thing against all of them. It starts you from a different point to kind of, it helps the math out. But it's not really a secret, you know? It's, it's like, it helps prevent the scaling. It helps them preventing every single thing you encrypt. But you, can, you have to actually store it on disk with it because otherwise you can't decrypt. So that's why the rest of it, you know, you convert your data to the bytes, you do the encryption, but that last step is where the IV comes in, because you have to keep that around. So a common technique um, is to append that IV to the bytes of the encrypted file. Front, back, doesn't really matter, as long as you know what you did. All right, so typically you just kind of combine those bytes together, encode them base 64, there you go, you got an encrypted string. All right, so let's dig into the storing part, because that's the interesting part. So here's how you store the key. Um, the technique I'm looking at here is the slightly easier technique to implement, and this is where you generate a key store and you use the passcode as the password of the entry in the key store. So that's kind of how you get the security aspect of it. So you make assault, or get assault, you know, depending on if it's the first time through or the second time through. Um, and then, because the assault, by the way, also finds a store, I'll go into the assault's bit in a second. Um, but then you hash the passcode, and you hash the passcode in case somebody has like a bad passcode, in case it's a short passcode. So that's why you want to salt it and hash it. Because this way, if it's one, two, three, four, and as you well know, 100,000 other users are gonna be using one, two, three, four, the attacker can't just look at the hashed password and be like, you know what, that's one, two, three, four, because I got eight other examples of it. So you take the salt and you take the passcode and you hash it together so they at least all look different. And that way your actual key entry, because you're using this as your password, will be different. So they can't just be like, oh, I know one, two, three, four hashes into this, boom, let's try it in the JKS and see if we can get it. So what you do is you hash the passcode with the salt, which is unique per entry of the device, and there you go. You have it so it's unique for every single JKS entry. That way if they sweep all your JKS files, they can't just like say, here's the hash for one, two, three, four, boom, 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 I got 100 users. Prevents the scalable attack. Make them work for it, you know? Um, and then you can look through the key uh, code. This is Java specific, so it may not be useful for a lot of you, but you put it into the key store password protection type. You can use the default, perfectly fine for this option. Um, put it in a secret key entry, take the key store, output it to the file, boom, there you go. All right, so that's salt. What is that salt? All salt is random bytes. Secure random, X number of bytes, that is 64 here. Um, it needs to be the same as the cipher size, I believe. So just secure random bytes. I store it straight to share preferences. Not a secret, purely there for scalable attacks, all right? In fact, it can't be a secret, because like I said, you have to be able to use it over and over or you kind of screwed yourself. Cool, all right, so that's how you do user passcode protection. But what if I need things in the background, all right? That's where hardware back solutions come in. You know, this is the new hotness. It does depend on the device though. <laughs> iOS, quite strong, especially newer uh, uh, devices and OSs. Android, you know Android, it's a mixed bag. All right, so depending on the device, this can be quite strong. Most of these are their own chip on the device, 
Some are software implemented, those are the weaker ones, but most are hardware backed these days. Um, this is actually a separate chip on the device. The key is generated in the device, never leaves the, the chip. And whenever you need to encrypt something, you actually pass that into that encryption chip and just get back strings. You never see the key yourself even. So very strong. And typically, and this is the nice part, it's available as long as the device is unlocked. And you can actually customize that. So especially, that's, this is still evolving over time. New OSs kind of change things up all the time. But typically, as long as the device is unlocked, it's available, which is very handy if you do a lot of background operations. You know, if you're like, checking for chat logs in the background, or if you're a banking app and you just want to send a heartbeat once in a while just to make sure you're still alive, that's where this really is handy. And it's the best you can get. You know, on a mobile device, it's about the best you're going to get these days. Because they can't export that key, they can't try to brute force it, they can't just like sweep the whole phone and do things, whatever they want offline. But the downside, if you rely on like transferring between devices, you know, if you're one of those more common use cases where you want to be seamless as soon as the user gets a new phone, not quite possible with a hardware key store. Like I said, it's not exportable. That chip won't allow that key to be exported, so even if like, Apple wanted to, they couldn't pump it through iCloud and put it down on the new device. So you're gonna have to assume that anything encrypted by this key may be lost, may be gone. So make sure that you have recovery flows in place um, where you have most of your data, but all the encrypted stuff is gone. Just make sure that you're able to kind of bootstrap yourself back up from that. You know, have some sort of flows in place. Be defensive about it. And this is great for more modern OSs, but when they first added this, very finicky, both in iOS and Android. I can speak from experience um, in Android, basically 6.0 and up is about the only thing I would use it on. If you still support older OSs, be very cautious about using the hardware key stores. iOS, I believe iOS 9 is about where it stabilized pretty good, um, which these days most people only support 9 and up anyways, but a lot of Android people support more legacy OSs. Be cautious on those older devices. You may want to do like a split where older devices do one path, newer devices do another. So how do I actually you know, do this? Really, most of it's the same. You know, it's still a key. You stall the same algorithms. Like The APIs actually kind of mask a lot of the usage portions of it. The difference is when you generate it. So right there, you see key generator algorithm. That get instance, the provider. It's not like standard bouncy castle. It's actually Android key store. That provider is specific in Android for using the trusted execution environment. <coughs> Apologies. Um, so iOS, similarly, it's, it's all down to when you generate the key, and then there's API wrappers around it for actually using it, which kind of masks all the nitty gritty. Um, and there's two more important points here I kind of wanted to point out, and that's purposes. That's the first one. So especially in the new OSs, they're getting better about this, where this helps, and again, those unknown broken scenarios, the scenarios where the OS itself is vulnerable. Because again, we shouldn't be trusting the OS. So when you generate the key, you can dictate exactly what purposes this key is able to be used for. You know, I'm only using this for encrypting and decrypting things. So don't give it the signing purpose. Don't give it the verifi verification purpose. You know, don't let people use it. That way, if they try to use it for that, you get a little flag. You'd be like, hey, what's going on? Somebody's trying to use my key here. You know, same if you're only using this for signing like JWTs, just give it sign and verify. You know, there's no need to let people encrypt things with it. <coughs> and then uh, the user authentication required is the next one. So this determines when you can access the key. And this is the one that's currently evolving on both platforms, where in Android right now, it's just yes or no. Um, or you can make it biometric, I think. <coughs> Apologies, let me get some water real quick. But um, this user authentication requires, especially in iOS, is very customizable. So basically, you can be like only five minutes from when the user authenticates, or 30 minutes, or half an hour. Or that is 30 minutes, an hour, sorry. <laughs> So that right there kind of sets your paranoia level. That's, that's kind of what that is very useful for. So say you, you know that in your app, you only want it being able to use like when you're active or something like that. Then you're like, cool. Only make it so that it's if the user is authenticated and recently, you know? Or this is for background purposes. You know, I'm just doing these background checks periodically. I don't really care like how recent it's been. Then just don't even require user authentication. You know, you can use it wherever. You trust the key store. We don't have to have it have been decrypted recently. Cool, so the last option I mentioned earlier is what about RAM-only storage? This is as secure as you can get. It's the best option. If they can read your RAM, you are beyond hosed. <laughs> so it's really the best you got here. But it's really only good for things that are volatile because this is not something that you can bootstrap with. It's already been bootstrapped, you know? If you have the refresh token in RAM only, it doesn't really do you any good. 
because your app's not in RAM ter terribly long. This is really good for things like access tokens or like PII that's very small or you don't mind fetching often, you know, very volatile stuff. Um, or usernames and passwords should always be RAM only. Any passcodes, anything that's like part of the user given portion of your encryption flows should be RAM only because it's the safest, it's the best. If you don't put it on a disk, then it can't be read by anything else reading your disk. But wait, there's more. So there's kind of two more concepts I want to dig into that aren't really about uh, how to store things on disk, how to store things directly. So the first is a client is only an expression of the server data. You know, there are cases where your client is generating data or has business logic to it, but you shouldn't really be storing the heart of your customer data on the client because it's, it's, you shouldn't trust these environments. So clients need to be reactive to the servers. You know, the server at any given time can revoke your access token. They can revoke your free refresh token. They can revoke or rotate certificates. So you really need to always code in a very defensive manner. You know, expect the server to do weird things at any given time. Like, want them to. Like, that's a good thing. Having the ability to revoke these tokens is like very good from a security posture perspective. So you gotta make sure your client apps are reactive to that and they respect that. You know, if they revoke a token, cool. Go to the sign up flow again. And then, have good sanitation, you know? Rotate things often. <coughs> so rotating things helps for those attacks where you don't know they're happening. You don't know it's happened yet. This helps make, makes kind of, say you had a bug in one version of your app, and but the very next uh, app, you made some change, but they don't even realizing it, you patched the bug, you know? Or you patched it, but you didn't think anybody used it yet. If you rotate things often, that really narrows the limo of uh, the window of how useful that attack was. Because if you rotate, say, the refresh token every 30 days, you know, make the user do a full re-auth every 30 days, that means there's only 30 days that attacker could attack your servers without you being aware of it. And then, like, cool, the next five years of Facebook's completely unencrypted passwords in a database <laughs> are not secret. <laughs> Or, or sorry, not vulnerable. So that really rotating things often is a good thing that you really should consider about any of your secret stuff, any refresh tokens, any certificates, any signing keys, any keys used for encrypting data. You know, Make the user rotate their passcode once in a while. It just really helps mitigate those undiscovered attacks. And then kind of as we like wrap up here, if I forget everything else, I've covered a lot of territory so far in this talk, like what should I remember? Client code is always public information. If it can be run on an OS, somebody can find out exactly what's in your code, all right? Nothing secret should go in client code. Don't trust the OS or hardware. This is deployed code. This code's not in your servers, behind a VPN, behind a firewall, with only like, you know, advanced server access, gaining access to it. You know, these things are out in like, who knows what OS, who knows what hardware, could be an emulator, you don't know. So don't trust it, you know, be defensive. Perfection's impossible. It's just not, not if a user wants to use it. You know, make your attackers hate you. Make them work. Hackers are lazy, you know? Make them put some effort into it. Make it so there's another target that's a lot easier and is a better opportunity. That's kind of what we're going for here. Then don't let attacks scale, you know? Ensure uniqueness. Every user should be unique, you know? Every encryption should be unique. Like, if they can break one piece of your data and break all of your user base, that's a high reward, low risk scenario for the attacker because they get everything for one single break, one single user with a bad password, you know? Make sure that if one user gets compromised, like, everybody else is fine. Don't let it scale. That way, sure, they get that user's data, but they don't get everybody. They don't get everything. They don't take your whole company down. And then rotate things often. Have good sanitation, you know? Look at the OWASP guidelines, you know? Look at the NIST guidelines. Like, just have good general sanitary habits about rotating things. And then, and this is something that people forget a lot, which I really want to drive it in. If it can be used to get a secret, it's just as valuable as the secret. All right? All that PII data, those are effectively passwords. You know? All those things you see on Facebook where it's like, oh, if your birthday is this month, post this, and month is this month, post that, then you have some funny name. They're trying to get at your PII. They're trying to find your birthday. So how many like recover password flows out there say, what's your birthday? What's your social security last four digits? You know, what's your grandmother's maiden name? So all that data is just as valuable because if they can reset your password, they have your password. You know, that's it. That's what you're trying to protect. 
So anything that can be used to generate a secret is just as valuable as the secret. And with that, I'd like to open up with any questions. I think we have a mic that we passed around. So. Uh, it's right behind you. Yeah. So is the yeah flip the switch on it. Okay. All right, Gabe. So I was curious what your opinion is on like modern MDM uh, 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 container in let's say encrypted containers. As far as the say you're running everything out of encrypted containers, and as far as I mean, what your feeling is as far as the security level uh, on the trustworthiness of, like say, AirWatch uh, MDM container, uh, as far as, you know, that's another layer of security as far as like potentially if, uh, you know, if the device is compromised. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I would say it's good, but I wouldn't say it's another layer of security. It's still, so in Android specifically, I can talk in depth about that. iOS is a different model that I'm not an expert on, so I'm not gonna fully speak to, but the encryption they're using is the same as the device encryption. So if the device is already encrypted, it's not adding a whole lot, it's changing it. So that way, if there's like a malicious app on the personal profile, it can't get at anything in the work profile. So there is a secure boundary there, um, but it doesn't really protect against rooted attacks. It doesn't protect about anything that has like escalated privileges. Because if they can break the device encryption or they can break the permission model, then it kind of doesn't really matter which profile it's in, whether it's a work or personal profile. Um, but it does help against unescalated attacks within a profile. So like, if there's some vulner vulnerability in like intents, where like you can like, ma like manipulate intents or broadcasts or something like that to get at some sensitive data, um, the work profile does shield you against that because those don't really cross the profile border. Um, but when it comes to actually like file-based encryption, it's, it's the same file-based encryption. You know, it may have a different passcode, but that's, uh, that's about the best. So it's not like a, a huge leap up. It's more like a separation of concerns. Any other questions? Cool. Well, if there's nothing else, um, I would like to thank all of you. Um, please like and subscribe. And <laughs> thank you very much. Hope you have a great time.